171. I sent, oh, I didn't. Yes, you sent this and I just printed it out. I'm going to go get it. And I, I didn't forward it to, to Amarin. So let me do that. Um, Amarin, I'm going to forward this to you. Um, Gail just forwarded to TJ and Christina. Um, okay, there we go. And okay. So I, we are going to hear right now, we have two new witnesses here with us. Um, uh, Steve Howard and Terry Corsones. And I would like to jump to um, Terry. Would you like to kick us off here? Um, and Terry, I, I don't, I'm sure you know all of us, but I'm going to introduce ourselves anyway, just in case. So Jeanette White from Wyndham. Anthony Polina, Washington County. Brian Collimore, Rutland County. Allison Clarkson. Windsor County District. It's good to see you, Terry. Nice to see you. And Senator Keisha Rahm is with us, but must be having some technical difficulties. She's from Wind Chittenden County. And um, I'm only sorry that we're not there to have your um, apple bread pudding. <laughs> or her cake or her cookies. I know. <laughs> I did deliver cookies to the pages um, this morning next door to you, Senator White. Um, yes. And I, wa I walked in on Senator Collimore, uh, uh, not realizing that he was in a, in a Zoom meeting, but so I'm sorry to have missed you all. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're sorry to miss you and your cookies. <laughs> so I'm going to ask Terry to um, weigh in on this issue. We have had a flurry of emails um, around this issue. And I sent some thoughts to the, and I know they're very simplistic, but I sent some thoughts to people. And, um, but Terry, would you like to weigh in on the issue as you see it? And then we also have Steve Howard here because this affects more than attorneys, but I don't see him here yet. No, Scott's here with us, Scott Griffith. Yeah. Yes, I, I, thank you. I do see him. Um, I was, uh, okay, Terry. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Terry Corsounds, Executive Director of the Vermont Bar Association. Thank you so much for allowing me to participate. I have been observing the, the committee hearings and on Friday um, saw, for example, Mike Kennedy, who I know had a conflict for today. So he had uh, contacted me and I offered to write up a memo at least setting forth from my understanding of the, the, v, the VBA's position in this matter. And I did submit that if, I don't know if people have seen it, but I'll just be testifying to summarize in, in general, just two basic points um, that I would like to make and, and strictly limited to the applicability of S-171 to Vermont licensed attorneys. That, that, that is all that my, my memo um, addresses. And I'm uh, coming from the context of the Vermont Constitution and also from the context of the Vermont Rules of Professional Conduct. You all have heard from, from others that there's that provision in the Vermont Constitution that indicates that the Vermont Supreme Court has disciplinary authority over all judicial officers and attorneys that law. And when the framers put that into the constitution, I've got to assume it's because there was a body of law for centuries whereby um, rules of ethics and uh, conduct kind of specific to attorneys because of attorney specific roles in the courts, in society uh, required. And I think it was made mention of, a, at least on Friday, of a higher standards of professionalism and ethics that are applied because when you think about the work that attorneys do, it's, it's oftentimes in a fiduciary capacity, uh, people's liberty, uh, they're representing people's liberty in today's context, you know, families, support, um, parentage, all kinds of very people's property, their life savings. 
so there's a, an expectation that there's a, a higher level, I think, of conduct uh, and ethics expectations. So in my mind, that's likely why the framers included that provision, because there was a system to address ethical complaints, for example, or disciplinary complaints against judges and attorneys. So there's that provision coupled with the other provision whereby the legislative, executive, and judiciary departments are separate and distinct so that neither exercise the powers properly belonging to the others. And that would include the power to discipline attorneys uh, and judges. And I, I noticed in the statute, uh, it already um, exempts, or as um, Senator White prefers saying, the Code of Ethics does not apply to judicial officers. It already says that. So in my mind, a very straightforward, clean way to um, acknowledge that that attorneys at law are subject to the same disciplinary authority as our judicial officers. If the phrase were uh, in this is in section 1202b2, if a phrase that read those subject, and this would say the code of ethics does not apply to those subject to the Vermont Supreme Court's disciplinary authority under chapter two, section 30 of the Vermont constitution. That would then make clear that the code does not apply to judicial officers or to attorneys in fact, again, because of what's already provided uh, in the constitution. But that to me would correct um, an inconsistency that's there now. And it would also ensure that one branch of government is not exercising a power properly belonging to another. The other aspect that I wanted to comment on is the Vermont Rules of Professional Conduct. And you all wouldn't necessarily have any reason whatsoever to, to ever look at them or to see them. But I did link to them so that you could see it. There are 158 pages of very detailed, extensive, thorough, um, again, compiled over decades, if not centuries, um, of rules of conduct and ethics specifically geared to attorneys' duties as officers of the court. Um, so. Uh, there's been commentary about how trying to fit the provisions in the uh, in S-171 into scenarios where attorneys are involved in and how they like people likened it to trying to fit a square um, peg into a round hole. And I think that's, again, why I think the framers likely had in mind the centuries of experience that resulted in the unique rules of conduct and ethics that already apply to attorneys and to judges. So there's a reason why they were exempted out. There was also commentary that, well, um, the Secretary of State has authority over attorneys who are notaries public, but in fact, that's not the case. In 26 VSA section 5305B2, uh, the Professional Responsibility Board has jurisdiction if there are any complaints about um, a notaries public who are attorneys. And that's because the Secretary of State acknowledged in light of this very same constitutional provision that the Supreme Court has disciplinary authority over attorneys and the Secretary of State recognized he did not. So there isn't any kind of precedent there um, regarding notaries public. And the last thing, and this is something that just came up in terms of what Mr. Um, Kinsley filed today. I don't think he testified on Friday, but he, he um, stated in his materials in support of including attorneys, he said, if the commission finds that someone has violated the code of ethics, it would be dependent upon another entity to take action to correct that wrong. So playing that out to its logical conclusion, if, for example, if attorneys were subject to the, the S-171 and somebody came to the commission and said, There's, I have an ethical complaint against this attorney, Presumably the commission would go through its process and say it found that there was an ethics violation. What would it do then? It would send it over to the professional responsibility program. <laughs> and presumably the professional responsibility program would go through its entire process, but applying those rules that are applicable to attorneys, because those are the ones that would be relevant and pertinent and say it found, okay, there's an ethics violation. What's accomplished? You've got a duplication of effort of process. For what reason? Say it found that there wasn't an ethical violation. What do you have then? You have a waste of the process that went through in the commission. 
So what was gained? What would be gained by the commission going through an exercise if ultimately the professional responsibility program, which has been in existence for centuries and um, is constantly being reevaluated, constantly being scrutinized, constantly being updated, um, it, it just seems that it wouldn't make any sense to have that extra separate exercise when for the last 200 plus years, it's, this court has been recognized as the proper authority. So I just wanted to make mention of that in light of Mr. Kinsley's submission. So my suggestion would be to substitute that phrase so that you have consistency with the constitution and um, no usurpation of, of, of powers. Any questions for Terry? Um, well, we need to take the testimony and then um, Christina will go to you for, and I know that you um, were thinking that the commission would not go through the investigation, but would funnel it. I think that's what you had in mind, but that would be true right now. But if there's ever enforcement for the commission, the commission would be the responsible party for doing it. So, okay, no, why not? If they're subject to, okay, never mind. We're going to go to, um, um, okay, Senator Clarkson. <laughs> yeah, she, she was <laughs> she was shaking her head when you asked that question. Yes, I know. Um, yeah, right, um, Terry. I, I think one of the, are you, I think one of the things we're struggling with is we want, I mean, at least I would hope, uh, and I think Ben and a couple other people would hope we'd have a universal code of ethics, you know, just this big umbrella and that we would then, uh, and that then every branch, I mean, your branch or at least the lawyers would be exempted through this additional language in our state code of ethics. So within the state code of ethics, if we can make an umbrella that works with some fairly simple universal understandings and then have any group that needs to be exempted because of uh, pre pre-existing uh, um, rules or that they would be exempted. Yeah in that bill, but that every initially in the, you know, that the bill is intended to provide this sort of universal standard, but that subgroups can be exempted. That, do you sort of get, I mean, I think that's, sort, at least that's my hope. And I think it's a couple other people's hope as well, uh, because I think we're happy to exempt groups that have pre-existing yeah. uh, frameworks for code, uh, ethics code and, and uh, protection. I mean, ethics, a, a, a code of ethics, like the legislature, like lawyers, like the court, but that we all begin agreeing that this is a, a, a fundamental foundational on, uh, on which we stand. Terry, did you want to respond to that? Did you even understand? I mean, I'm sorry. Yeah. That was a ramble. I'm sure. And I, and I'm, I don't know if it's my connection. Oh, no, no, no. I understood. I and I apologize because I don't know if it's my connection, but it was broken up a little bit. But I mean, we would have certainly no disagreement that ethics are critical. Some code of ethics is critical. And, and I'm sorry, I didn't hear all of the days of testimony, but I, I, I believe that there wasn't um, a code of ethics in the executive branch primarily is where I guess they're trying to um, make sure that there's a foundation. So I guess I would just ask that there be a distinction between, I guess, if, if that was lacking for the executive branch, that there be in the grand scheme here an acknowledgement that, you know, at least uh, for as long as the constitution's been in effect, there's been an effort to have this code of ethics for uh, the judicial branch and certainly attorneys at law, that's what I'm most familiar with. But um, I don't think anybody would disagree that it's critical that we have um, basic ethical principles that govern. But um, if it's possible to exempt out those who, who are already subject to, it, in my view, very robust ethical standards that are patterned to the scenarios and the circumstances that pertain to attorneys, because as 
like Mike Kennedy pointed out, the conflict of interest, the events of impropriety, those are just going to, I think, wreak havoc if you're trying to make them fit because it, it's just two different, the, the circumstances are too different in terms of when and what, and what would be a violation for an attorney when it wouldn't be a violation for someone, for example, in the executive branch, just because of conflicts of interest, attorney-client privilege, disclosure, prohibitions, uh, it, it gets very complicated. <laughs> So I'm, I thank you. I'm going to jump to Steve because I think he also has some new information and we've, and I would encourage us if we haven't read um, the email from Matt Valerio and from John Campbell um, to, to read those uh, because I think they speak to what um, Terry was just talking about. I'd like to go to Steve Howard because I think that there's um and John, John Campbell was beyond the, just the attorney issue, but he also had the issue of uh, post-employment, uh, post-government service employment, and that would completely limit um, some state deputy, some states' attorneys and deputy states' attorneys, and that is an infringement on their rights, I believe, and. So I'd like to hear from Steve Howard, and um, and that, I think that that's a lot of your issue also, but that it affects more than just state's attorneys. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, um, Vince um, is actually going to testify on our behalf on this issue. Okay, thank you as an attorney. Thank you. Okay, Vince. Hi, thank you, Madam Chair, and hello to everyone. Um, I wanted to, to be brief. It looks like you have a boatload of witnesses but as I read the uh, provision in S-171, the provision would restrict any person from uh, taking employment where the state is a party. And I think the unintended consequences, the ramifications are far reaching and uh, perhaps not as thought out as they uh, could be. With regard to attorneys, I think you've got that covered pretty well. But for example, if I stopped being a state's attorney, I could not be a defense attorney or even a private attorney representing anyone if the state is involved. And uh, as, as we all know, Vermont is a, a government by permit and we have tax issues, land use issues. I, I couldn't even represent somebody in trying to get their motor vehicle license or permit back. Um, to, to further the discussion, which I think you've been having in the last few minutes, there are already a number of uh, laws on the books that govern uh, conflicts. And in addition, almost every licensed or registered profession has some type of code of conduct, whether it's specific to the profession or trade, or uh, whether it's the more generic one that applies as somewhat of a common denominator across all licensed and registered uh, professions. Um, I think this is um, akin to something which the courts disfavor, and that is a, a covenant not to compete, where someone works for a company, they say, we will let you work for us, but in exchange, you have to sign an agreement that when you stop working for us, you can't work for X number of years in a certain geographic area. Uh, I see this akin to that type of approach and believe that in a state like Vermont, where you need to do more than one job to survive in most parts of the state. Um, I see this as a restraint on trade. Uh, instead of restricting the number of people who are trained, eligible, experienced to go out and take jobs, which we can't fill, I see this job, uh, this bill doing exactly the opposite, further restricting the pool of labor that would enable us to get out of the crisis that we have right now with. Uh, recruitment and retention of workers across all trades, across all professions at the state, county, and municipal level. So that's my take and uh, thank you very much. Any questions for Vince? So committee, I, I just sent an email and I, I do apologize for being such a Grinch about this bill, but the, the way we've been doing this and then continuing to make exemptions 
it makes it more and more and more complicated and more and more complicated to understand. And um, I, I have a couple basic issues. One is that I'm not sure that the other states that we've been talking about have in their constitutions that the General Assembly is respons completely responsible for the General Assembly and the judiciary, the Supreme Court is completely responsible for the judiciary. I don't know if they do have those in their constitutions and they're able to do this anyway, then that, um, I, I, that, that changes my opinion a little bit, but I don't know that they have that in their constitutions, but we do, we have it in our constitution. And my other concern is that this is getting so complicated that I, when I think of a code of ethics, I think of it as kind of akin to the Boy Scouts Pledge of Honor or the 4-H Pledge of Honor. I'm going to do these things and I'm not going to do these things. And I looked up the 4-H one and it says, I won't um, do my exhibits in a certain way or I will. And it, so there are these 10 kind of things. And so I don't understand why we don't have a, a code of ethics that's the basic things. The person shall avoid any conflict or interest of a pair or appear, the appearance of conflict of interest. Th shall not direct another person to act in a manner that would be unethical. Shall, in the course of conducting state businesses, act impartially, showing no favor, blah, blah, blah. All of those. Those were the 12 points that were in that were the kind of headings in the, in the code of ethics. And then charge, instead of then trying to define under these what it is for an executive branch employee, what it is for a judicial branch employee, a, instead of trying to define them, have each branch define instead of trying to put it all the words in here and then do exemptions for people. I don't understand. I, I don't understand why that is such a difficult concept. To me, it makes a lot of sense, but I guess it doesn't um, in for the, the post-employment, for example, is very different. There are laws that say what we can't do in post-employment. We can't become a lobbyist. There are um, codes of conduct that say what an attorney shouldn't be doing post-employment, post-government employment. There are um, the legislative staff, we haven't even talked about them yet, that that says that they can't. So Michael Grady, if he got really sick and tired of us, he could not decide to be, become an attorney that worked for a utility company. He couldn't do it because it says in here that he can't, um, that the legislative staff can't represent anybody that would be um, in conflict with the guy. I, I just, I don't see why, and I just want other people to weigh in here, but I do not understand why we would do all of these things. Gifts are very different for different people. The, the how you recuse yourself after a code of conflict is, I mean, a conflict of interest is very different for the legislators than, and for the um, attorneys. There, it's a different process. So why do we have, why are we trying to get all of those processes and exemptions into, into the state code of ethics instead of having a broad state code of ethics and then having the, anyway, you, you get my drift, so. Yes, Senator Clarkson. So I, I agree with you. I mean, I think we need a broad code of ethics and yes. then a, chap, a chapter maybe on each branch and then deal with it in, in a very, it, it could, I think, it, I think we could handle it that way. I, how, I do we do a, how do we do a chapter on each branch in the, in the bill? Well, I thought Terry that's what just you said. That their, Terry just said their code of ethics for attorneys is 158 pages. Are we going to put that in here? No, we're going to defer to that code. To those. That's what I, I that's that what is. Just suggested. Sorry, I thought that's what you just suggested. What I suggested is that we just have a code of ethics and then we, we refer the, the details for each of those 10 points 
would be developed and carried out by the particular branch. That's all. Uh, Senator Polina. First of all, I really appreciate you trying to figure this out along with the rest of us, of course, yeah. and I don't blame yeah, you for feeling frustrated and somewhat disappointed and discombobulated because I think we're all feeling that at this point. I want to back up for a minute um, and just because we talked about a lot of exemptions and that's part of the frustration. I just want and I'm not taking a position necessarily. I just want to talk this through. I mean, what I think we're talking about exempting is this is at this point is the judiciary, the judges, the lawyers and um, the legislature at, at some level. And the legislature is a little bit of both. But if that's the case and, and um, I forget, um, Terry said that we could insert language that would essentially exempt the lawyers along with the judiciary from the from the code. That would be one exemption. There would be that exemption and the exemption for the legislature. Not, I don't want to call it an exemption for the legislature, but it's a partial exemption for the legislature. I guess all I'm, what I'm saying is that I don't think that's a lot of exemptions when you say it out loud. I'm not saying it's good, but I'm saying it doesn't feel like that much when you say it out loud. I like the idea that you put forward about keeping it simple, though. I really do. Just not sure if we had a really an, an ethics commission with enforceable powers, they would be able to interpret those, you know, people raise issues and bring complaints and the, and the, the uh, commission would be able to decipher what's going on and make a decision. But without them being able to interpret those codes, those 12 things, we'd have to, like you said, ask each department to write it up for themselves. That could just be that could just be more trouble than it's worth. I think. Anyway, I don't want to ramble on about. It. I just think I think that the exemptions are not that many if we really look at them realistically. I think the bill is complicated, and that's that's a problem. But I think, and I think if um if the if what Terry talked about exempting the lawyers would would include people like Michael Grady and legislative counsel staff, that could mm -hmm. help solve part of the problem, the dilemma that we're feeling. It would also mean Gail couldn't take a job. Not as an attorney, but Gail couldn't take a job because it says legislative staff. Right. So, right. and my, I, I didn't mean that the commission should interpret these. What I meant is that for each of these things, the branch responsible would come up with, with what does conflict of interest mean for the executive branch? What does conflict of interest mean for the judiciary? And I and I don't think it's just the judges because and the attorneys because the Constitution says I shall administer the court sure. system, and that includes their employees. So yeah. that they, they they would have it, and then the legislature has its code of ethics and says this is what conflict of interest is for us, and that could be those would be in the hands of the ethics commission but wouldn't be in the statute itself because conflict of interest as defined in here that also and it does say that it doesn't apply to our core legislative um activities Function, but, yeah. and i've tried to do some research on core legislative activities and what i come up with is voting not meeting with constituents and not going to meetings and not working on bills, but um, voting. Well, we did get a, we did get a memo from someone. It might have been Christina. I'm not sure. Some, someone yeah. sent the memo, which did research into the legislative issue, and basically it did say that meeting with constituents was was core. Committee meetings were core. That the kind of stuff. I don't. Then, know, I can't remember then the we're detail, exempt but. if it exempts that us we, from our core legislative. Um, work and everything that we do is core then we're exempt completely well except when we still wouldn't be allowed to take bribes and stuff like that well but, but that's so already I, state that's law. I said i said it's a partial exemption no that's already state law that is state law right. and, the, and the last um thing in the code of ethics that was given to us by the commission and which i have on my number 10 is shall abide by statutes regulating Oh, just post-government employment, but it's also um, shall not. There was one that said you shouldn't um, break the law. Anyway, Senator Collimore. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> and not to disagree with Senator Polina, for whom I have the utmost expect, uh, respect. But I think I'm looking at it the other way and probably more like the chair is. I think she's laid out a, a, 
a structure that makes some sense with, and I don't know how many there are, there are 10, 11, 12 sort of, I don't want to call them bullet points, but let's call them areas of agreement, regardless of the branch, that everybody can sort of say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then leave it up to each individual branch to flesh out, expand, enumerate, however you want to phrase that, their own view of life is in terms of ethics. So there wouldn't be any exemptions uh, to use Senator Polina's um, language. I, I don't think we need to put exemptions in statute. I think all we need to do is say, here's what everybody can agree on. And then each of the three branches will go further. And I don't know what the language should be, but will be responsible for their own jurisdictional oversight in terms of, uh, of how they put this together. That's it seems to make more sense to me than, than saying, okay, here it is, except this guy doesn't have to, and this guy doesn't have to, and this guy doesn't have to. I think it should be the other way around. Everybody agrees on this. Now go and uh, figure out for your own branch how best to do that. One of the things we'd have to think about and in, in going in that direction, I'm not arguing with this. I'm really just brainstorming, believe me. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know, but we talk about the need, to, uh, the desire to have everybody under the same code of ethics. Now, obviously, we're talking about exemptions, so that goes out. That concept goes out the window. We're not talking about everybody anymore. But um, we talked about how the snowplow driver should be held to the same standard as the governor. You know, the governor should be held to the same standard as snow track snowplow driver. We would we would end up with a code of ethics that varied department from not department but branch of government to branch, branch of government. To branch. And I don't know, that's just, that could, that's, just, that's a dilemma. I'm not opposed to the idea necessarily. I'm just saying that's another wrinkle in this whole thing because we've been talking about keeping everybody on the same standard. Senator Clarkson. Sadly, Anthony, they already are on different standards. And so and, and I think that you're right, that this discussion reflects our frustration and they're not being able, it would be great if we could begin 250 years ago and sort of get everybody on the same standard. But I think uh, I like the notion of, of positively stating everything to go to Brian's point and, and Jeanette's exempting less and saying yes to more, saying yes to judiciary and lawyers, saying yes to the legislature. And that this is the, the exec, what's left is this is what the executive branch is, uh, you know, is the core code of ethics for the executive branch. But I, it, it, it's wonder, it's better to have a yes, yesable propositions and, uh, and begin with this thing we all agree with and then delegate the authority to oversee it to the branches as they oversee it now. Jeanette, Jeanette would you envision, if we went in that direction, would you envision, let's say we pass a bill that has the 12 to 10 points on it ask each to each um, each branch of government to come up with its own code. They would report back to the commission or someone like like there's be a deadline for them to come up with the code. It's funny what you think mechanically how that might work. If, you, well, if you've I, gotten that far and thinking about it. If you haven't, I, hadn't, I hadn't gotten that far, but I think that the judiciary could just um, forward their their book. They, they're pretty well set. I think the legislature is probably pretty well Said. I mean, we have um, Masons and our rules, so we would put those into it. And the executive right. branch, I, well, human resources has um, has some. I don't know that it applies to everybody. So I, I, but this could be it for the executive branch. I mean, what's left in stated positively uh, could be it for the executive branch. Well. They're we just need, to, we need to rethink that a little bit too, because I believe that the Department of Sheriffs and um, State's Attorneys is under the executive branch. And so their attorneys would be uh, so lawyers. So they're also under. I know, but they Harry. are under the executive branch. So if this is so, then where do they fall? Do they fall into the the conflict of interest as defined by the executive branch or by the um, judiciary and or by the um, pro professional code of regulation. And, and do they, are, are they able to move from being convinced is um, a government employee? And I think 
under the ex I don't know. Are you under the executive branch or the judicial? Uh, exec, exec, ex, ex, executive branch. Okay. So you would not be able to quit your job and become a defense attorney. Well, if I read it correctly, that's, that's right. Right. But aren't you covered first by your profession rather than your employment? So your profession, as Terry says, is as a lawyer. So you're covered at, by but your if profession he had, but, first rather than your employment. But if this apply, if this applies to all executive branch employees, he is an executive branch employee. <laughs> and you can't say, except right. it's not going to apply if he's covered someplace else. Right. It, you know, it, I, it, it I, either I, applies I, to all executive branch employees or it doesn't. Right. I was speaking to an architect that used to work for state buildings the other day. Uh, if I read that correctly, and again, you folks have heard all the hearings. I haven't. Um, I don't think um, that architect would be able to be involved in a project where the state is a party, you know, and they do a lot of work all over the state. And uh, I'm just suggesting you tread carefully. Clearly, you can't argue with the concept behind this bill, but the way you write it, you got to be careful. You don't have those unintended consequences. And I think if you're going to delegate authority, I think you're going to have to direct every licensed uh, profession or trade to, to, to revise their code of conduct to ensure that uh, the legislative intent is carried out, but not to the point where you're putting people out of business. That's the fear. On the other hand, like 45 other states have already done this. And it just seems yeah. amazing to me that, you know. I want to know if those 45, I, there's have, my question, Anthony, is do those 45 other states also have in their constitutions, right. no, they all you. do have that in their constitutions that the Supreme Court regulates the judiciary oh. and the um, General Assembly regulates itself? That's a question for TJ. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's my no question. Idea. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, all but I think three of the states have separation of powers provisions in their <laughs> constitutions. All of the Northeast states have uh, provisions that are, if not identical, substantially the same in that they very clearly parse out the, and delegate the duties of each branch and say that they cannot cross over one another. Okay, so I, I have not seen their constitution, so I have no idea that, um, so, okay, I guess that, ends that conversation if if other states have it in their constitutions as clearly as as in ours um okay yes senator colomar thank you madam chair so tj i'm i guess i'm struggling here <clears throat> if we went the way that i'm starting to feel that we should which is the way the chair feels and we enumerate sort of basic concepts right off the bat and then just say each branch will make them more or less as that well they can't make them less will will make them you know flesh them out aren't we in essence doing the same thing as just sort of doing a state code of ethics i mean the end result is the same isn't it it's not really the same and that I mean, the, the easiest way to view it is the way that the, you know, national uh, integrity bodies, um, nonprofits view it. And they have sort of a hierarchy that roughly plays out as, you know, the lowest and most criticized are those that don't have a code of ethics and don't have uh, an ethics commission. And there's very few of those states. The next tier, though, is those that have uh, either a commission that does not have uh, much real authority or uh, a separate branches approach that it, it sounds like you're, you're leaning toward. And yep. that's not to say it, it won't work in the state of Vermont, but th there are certain disadvantages that come along with each branch coming up with its own code. Obviously, they can tailor it for themselves, but the uniformity is gone. And so if you have, by way of example, a maintenance worker uh, in the judicial department might 
engage in some type of conduct, let's say uh, hiring a, a daughter uh, for a job, that might be treated differently than it gets treated in the executive branch, and it might get treated differently than it would in the legislative branch. And that, in addition to not having a uh, uniform code, it also ends up raising problems down the line because there's a view of unfairness from the employees and oftentimes from the union's perspective that they're not being treated uh, in the same manner for the same conduct. Yeah. I oh, could... oh, I'm sorry. So explain to me a little bit about, so I'm really hung up on a couple things here. The conflict of interest, it says, each time a public service is confronted, servant is confronted with a conflict of interest, public servant shall either make a public statement recusing themselves from the matter, or if he chooses to go, proceed, write a written statement. My understanding is that this would violate attorney client privileges. It would, so we're already saying that if this applies to everybody, it, it doesn't apply to everybody because, and so we'd have to say, however, this does not apply to attorneys and it, it doesn't a, apply to legislators because every time they wanna, if, if I stand up and say, I'm not gonna vote on this because under rule 73, I might, it might be perceived I have a conflict. I'm gonna have to write a statement. But in fact, what happens is that the rest of the 29 senators either say, yeah, you're right, you can't vote on it, or they say, it's okay. So we've already identified two different um, places here where, this, where there are exceptions to this. And my, so my concern is that when we do this and then we try to apply it across the, to everybody, that it doesn't apply to everybody. So can, can you address that a little bit? Sure, I can try. And as a threshold matter, uh, I apologize. We, we had a very fruitful conversation with uh, the judicial branch on Monday. And in response to that, circulated some draft language to see if it satisfied their concerns. And uh, to, to my knowledge, we haven't heard back yet, but that was one of the issues that was addressed that this may be a, a little too cumbersome in the way of uh, people recusing themselves. And generally speaking, if you're going to recuse yourself from a matter, that should be the end of the conversation right there because you're not engaging in any act that could be a conflict of interest, you're no longer involved. Mm -hmm. But it's the situation where you say, I do have a conflict of interest and I do choose to go forward that becomes potentially problematic. And so in order to address that, we previously uh, had language that drafted uh, as it, the de minimis exception as something that you would explain on a form. The proposed language we sent to the judiciary would exempt that straight away from the definition of a conflict. So that if you had a conflict, but that conflict was de minimis and you chose to go forward, you would not have to do anything or ministerial for that matter. If there's no decision-making process that has to be a part of what you're doing, if it's purely ministerial, then that would not have to be the subject of filling out a form. And the reason that we did that was a, a very valid concern uh, from the judicial branch, that, that they have uh, people who are at the desks who take paperwork from people and if uh, somebody who would otherwise constitute a conflict of interest came in just to hand them papers for filing, it would technically fall under the current language as you have in front of you. And that's a very valid concern. We don't want to cause uh, people who have no decision-making authority to have to fill out a form every time one of those ministerial or de minimis contacts come in. The final thing I would say is with respect to the legislature, um, because of the unique stature of the legislature uh, with respect to legislative duties, um, irrespective of whether you stood up and said, I have a conflict and this is what it is, I'm going to get rich off of this bill and I'm gonna vote anyway, that really is still within your core legislative function. It might not be something that everyone agrees with, but it still falls outside what the code would cover. 
I, I, I guess I didn't understand that because our, our code of ethics says that the other members of the body decide whether we have a conflict or not. Yes, but that, that has nothing to do with the code of ethics. Once you're inside your legislative duties, and I apologize, it was a little late, but I sent you both my own uh, rendition of what falls within legislative duties and also a presentation that's a little more layman's term that the uh, National Conference of State Legislatures uh, conducts. But it, it goes through all of the things that legislators, because of their unique position under the Constitution, simply can't be touched by any other branch. So then we're completely exempt from this code of ethics. Well, I think that probably says too much. For example, if you stepped outside of your legislative duty and called up a uh, contractor and said to the contractor, I'm a legislator. I know that you have a bill coming up next session. And by the way, my son is looking for a job. I think he really would benefit from a job uh, at, at your company, your contracting company. Well, now you've sort of gone outside your legislative duties. It doesn't really have anything to do with the decision-making process of a legislator, but that would pretty squarely fall under the code of ethics as engaging in conduct to benefit a, a family member uh, using your state position. Although I think that that would be covered under governmental conduct regulated by law, but maybe not. And if you're using your legislative, if you're saying I'm a legislator, you're using your legislative position, you're not outside of your, if I call up and say, I'm Jeanette White and I'm calling somebody in Connecticut and they don't have any idea who I am, then that would be outside of my, but if I call somebody up and say, I'm a legislator and you should do this, that is within, that is using your, your office in, a, in an inappropriate way. And I think that is already covered, but I may be wrong. Anyway, other, I see Pat has her hand up. Pat, are you there? I am here. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Lots to talk about. Uh, well, as you were talking about make, keeping it simple and, you know, the 10, 10, 12 items, I was thinking that that's starting to make a lot of sense, but then um, kind of did full circle. The key, uh, the word uniformity to me means means everything um, because my, my personal um, position here is about Vermonters and what what they need in this process. And I think they need clear uniformity, clarity. What's, what is it we're expecting of all three branches of their government? And where can they go to feel comfortable that their um, concerns will be heard? Um, and I think right now, if I may, with no, uh, with, if it goes to the judiciary, I, I don't think there's that sense of um, uh, comfort um, if I was a, a Vermonter going to the judiciary to, to make a comment about somebody from the judiciary or the legislature, I think we're here to set the record straight for Vermonters. And somehow we're sort of losing that in, in this discussion. And, um, and so I, I take back my idea that maybe you are on the right track. I think it has a lot of merit, but it would create such chaos, almost sort of where we are right now with um, everybody's saying and doing different things. So um, making it, uh, having it enforced would be a real problem, but it's the people of Vermont that were, that deserve some, a real clarity of what we expect and what they expect and where they can go to feel comfortable that they will be heard. That's just sort of where I'm at right now. Thank you. And I think the where they can go is the ethics commission. Exactly. And, and uh, that's, I think that's always been clear. Then that's yeah, and, the underlying legislation. Yeah. And I think that's what they need. And I know having been in personnel for years, I've heard that more often than not, when people who would like to go talk to somebody, because they're not even sure about whether what they um, are thinking is 
a conflict. They just need to talk to somebody. And um, uh, what we were going on this bill was going to set that up for them, that they've got a clear definition of what conflict means and where can they go. And I, about it. Yeah, I think you're right, but I don't think it is a clear definition of conflict because there are the conflict is very different for attorneys and for people in the judiciary and for legislators. So it isn't this just this definition. Well, so I don't think it's as, as different as we're making it out to be because we're coming up with, and I'm doing the same thing too. I'm sitting here, well, what about this or what about that? Um, I, I think it's. I think we're making it maybe a little bit more complicated because we're because I remember Jim Condos and Jim Greenwood. I talk about them at my show all the time. When there was an issue for them on the Senate floor, they stood up and said, I'm recusing myself. And they were they were relentless. And they said, I work for utility. I can't vote yep. on this. And they would sit down and everybody would, would respect their decision and move on. And Since I've been there, that has not yep. happened. Jim Condos would stand up and say, I believe I have a conflict of interest. And the rest of the legislators would say, it isn't any more of a conflict of interest than anybody else would have. I mean, you don't stand to gain any more than anybody else. And so yeah. you can proceed, but, but- um, It was there and they recognized it. So I think yeah. what, what you're doing with this bill is it's gotta be uniform. It's gotta be very, and it's gotta be clear and understandable. And I agree with you there. That's why I was sort of going off into taking a left-hand turn there about the keeping right. it simple. But, but it, it, this is a, not a simple co- issue. It's just complicated. It isn't. And I would hate to see if uh, Jim Condo stood up and said, I believe I have a conflict because I work for Burlington Gas and Electric. Um, and the uh, other people said, um, you can go ahead, that he would have to then write down his reasons on right. this piece of paper and turn it in. But that's what it says here. And, and so either... So. If I may, that's that's almost to protect Jim in, on those cases because if it gets challenged later on, it's sort of protecting him. And Jim Greenwood would do the same thing back back in the day. They were very good at that. Okay, I, anyway, I just okay. I just think you guys are on are on the right track with this bill, and and we need to. I hope it works out, but I think everybody's got to be included and. In, and we'll deal with it as, as it comes along. And I think your idea the other day of, of visiting the issue in a year from now, I think that was a good, that was a good discussion. So I, I just wanna ask Pat one more thing. How would you deal with the issue that Vince brought up? Because under this, he would not be allowed to leave his position as a state's attorney and become a defense attorney. Well, I think there's there's got to be some language that we can come up with to allow that. No, no, it's it's not because that's that was when I was working. That was an issue, and they they've they resolved it because this is Vermont. There's not so many jobs. For, well, there are these days, but there's not so many um, jobs. So you've got to open the door for people. I I realize that, and that I think Anthony, the Anthony's point about writing something and then having lots and lots and lots of exemptions. Right. Is not, but that's what we would be doing here. And, and I think that Steve Howard had, um, and Vince also had issues that weren't just the attorney issues, but people in other positions in state oh, government. The, that would, the lobbying, the lobbying issue is, is an issue for, um, uh, that that's all, I get though, that, uh, that I get. That's already state law. That's right. That's, that's already right. state law. So Scott. Yes, thank you, Senator White. And Pat McDonald, we've not met, but um, your comments uh, that you made a few minutes ago when you began speaking make me think that I didn't do a very good job on Friday describing uh, the um, plans, the programs that are in place within the judicial branch that, that we feel should give people a high level of confidence about how we manage our affairs. And I'd be happy to visit with you outside of the meeting um, to answer any questions you have or uh, explain our processes more fully. Uh, the other thing I just wanted to recognize, and Senator White, I appreciate you uh, a little while back bringing the conversation back to rooting it in what are constitutional principles. And we've been discussing for the last few minutes the application 
of this version of a bill or that version of a bill. But I just want to point out that the committee's um, apparent recognition that uh, judges and lawyers, judges are already exempted from the bill. Lawyers, it sounds the committee is considering whether to add that language, and we would advocate for that. Uh, the, 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 the reason that's being cons is considered is because the court, under its existing constitutional authority, has done what is required and put in place programs to govern uh, uh, the behavior of and discipline judges and lawyers. We do the exact same thing under the exact same authority with the rest of our staff. So I, I, uh, we, we can talk about judges, we can talk about lawyers, but then there's all of the other people who work within the judicial branch. And we would argue that their identity is uh, like that of the, uh, we have a code of conduct that they are bound to apply, abide by. It's embedded in our contract with the VSEA. It's recognized as applicable. Uh, and then the last thing I'll just say is, uh, follow up to Mr. Jones' comment. Um, it was a fruitful conversation that we had, several of us on the judiciary side, with, with him and with Ms. Savret, and we really appreciate their willingness to listen and their receptivity. Um, and so just for the committees, uh, for the record, and so the committee knows, we value that a great deal. Uh, uh, but Mr. Jones, I, I would also just point out when, when we're talking about the hierarchy and the, the relative, the ranking of systems to, uh, to um, promote and govern ethical behavior, one of the pieces is enforcement. And um, uh, again, for the record, we do have within the brand, within the judicial branch enforcement mechanisms that cover everybody who falls under our umbrella, and uh, I don't want the committee to lose sight of that. Uh, and uh, I, I I don't know that it's um, uh, Mr. Kinsley. Uh, his memo raises the point that the separation of powers issue really becomes only a potential issue when we're talking about enforcement. I don't know that I necessarily agree with that. Um, and I think that what we're talking about here is putting into law, codifying, um, formalizing, recognizing a role for the Ethics Commission um, that could make those conversations when it comes inevitably to issues of enforcement and what the limits are the enforcement powers of the, of the executive branch relative to the other branches. It complicates that conversation. So even though this does feel difficult and encumbered this conversation, um, I, I think it's important and I think it's helping to clarify issues and um, maybe just as importantly, uh, potential uh, ways forward. Thank you. I'm gonna go to Christina. You're muted, Christina. Sorry, apologize. So I apologize before if I, my shaking my head, uh, Ms. Uh, understood to be rude. I didn't mean to do that. I just felt like we're going down um, a path. There's maybe a misunderstanding in terms of the role of the commission and how that would play out in terms of attorneys. So I think that one of the issues that came up when you're talking about attorneys was that there are there is a duty to the client and that is definitely you know something that is front and center when it comes to the rules of professional conduct. And then when we're looking at codes of conduct, like the one that judiciary currently has in their employee handbook, we're looking at um, responsibilities to the employer and to the public. And so there could be a complaint that comes in that overlaps, but also they are at the same time very separate. And so if a complaint were to come into the commission that was related to the code of conduct or the code of ethics and it applied only there, then we would only be looking at it from that perspective. If it's something that was related to um, the rules of professional responsibility, then that's where the home for that would be. So we're looking at kind of like different relationships set up there. And I think TJ could also chime in here. If Vermont were to exempt attorneys, we'd be the only state in the country that did that. It'd be a very unusual situation you know, I'm an attorney, it is very common to be covered by multiple codes of conduct, including state codes of conduct, and this codes of conduct for any and all of the bars uh, of which you are a member. So I just wanted to make it clear that um, we are, we, we are concerned about attorneys, but I do think we came together in this discussion and talked about what the different roles are there, you know, duty to client, duty to employer, 
duty to the public. Uh, these are different things. And we also did come up with wording. I do understand that there's been some misinterpretation of the intent of the language regarding, you know, post-employment uh, issues. And so that was never intended to address attorneys who are, you know, leaving the state, going to private practice, you know, going into becoming a criminal defense attorney when you've been a prosecutor. Obviously, that's a very common situation. So the intent, and I don't believe in other states that have the same language, it's interpreted that way. But certainly we have come up with draft language that would cover that situation, because when looking at it, it seems that it, it is causing confusion. And just in terms of, we've done so much work you know, so far just the past few weeks, but I also think there's, you know, two years of work that's gone into this draft that we have now, and that includes a long public comment period. And so while I do understand the quest for simplicity, I think it is important to recognize that we do have public comment from many, many parties that are represented in this current draft. And I do think that, you know, I think as a group or a small and mighty group, there is the tendency to uh, deal with hypotheticals, everything that could go wrong. But if we were to just take this draft, bring it to a bigger audience, I think at this point, um, you know, ethics is in the news right now. Um, it's in the background, <laughs> but it's in the news. And in this election year, I do think the voters and the public would appreciate really seeing where their representatives stand when it comes to ethics. Um, you know, we could, continue on the path that we're on now. It's pretty, it's been pretty intense, but I do think we've come to, you know, more levels of agreement than not. But I do think it would be a great idea if we could take this outside of where we are now and bring it to the next step, which involves a bigger conversation with a bigger group of people. The voters could see where legislators stand. The members could show the voters where they stand on ethics and any changes that we think are truly required I mean, they can, this is one step. They could be handled, you know, during the floor vote, there's chances for amend amendments when it goes to the house, there's chances for changes. But right now, it just feels like we're kind of going back over issues we've discussed before. And I do think that if we put a provision in the bill where we came back a year after this was enacted and looked at language changes that were necessary, we would see that a lot of our fears haven't been realized, but where they have been realized, we can make those changes then. And we'll also have the opportunity to see where training would resolve the problem versus changes in language. Thank you. I'm going to jump to Mike and then I'm going to just make one, one other comment. And then unfortunately we have another issue that we're supposed to be dealing with at 315. Um, um, but my, I guess one of my comments would be that the, the larger conversation is with the General Assembly and with the Senate. And I'm not sure that this would pass the Senate because they're going to have the 25 other people are going to have the same questions that we've had here. And so I, we need to have something that's going to pass and also pass 150 people in the House. And then the, so that's the larger audience. And I just do have some concerns that if we pass, even if we got this passed, that there, there are some things in here that will impact people in the, once it becomes statute, for example, the representative um, representation restrictions. The way I read that is no public servant can knowingly make with the intent to influence any communication or appearance before any entity of the state on behalf of any other person other than the state in connection with any investigation, application, request for a ruling or determination, rulemaking, contract, controversy, claim, charge, accusation, arrest, quasi-judicial, judicial, or other proceeding. So somebody couldn't leave and then represent somebody in a permit application um, against the state or um, challenge a, a permit that was granted or not granted. So this, this, if we pass this, this could have an impact on people in the before we get a chance to, to. Um, so I, I don't want to go into that right now because, mm -hmm. but I'm just afraid that if we pass it, it will have impact on people that we are not anticipating, and that um, that impact would last for a year unless the bill was until the bill was changed. So that's just a a comment. So I'm going to go to Mike very quickly. Very quickly, thank you. I just wanted to add to your prior point. I don't doubt that there are 
most states have separation of powers clauses in their constitutions. What I don't know, however, is how many states actually have the more specific clause that Vermont has, that is the Supreme Court is vested with the authority to discipline judicial officers and attorneys. I think that's an important distinction from just a regular, if you will, separations of power, separation of powers clause. I'd also just point out that in the rules of professional conduct, there's a very lengthy preamble that talks about a lawyer's professional responsibilities and duties. And those duties are not limited to duties that lawyers owe to their clients. The very first clause is a lawyer as a member of the legal profession is a representative of clients, an officer of the legal system, and a public citizen having special responsibility for the quality of justice. It concludes many pages later, as Terry mentioned, lawyers play a vital role in the preservation of society. The fulfillment of this role requires an understanding by lawyers of their relationship to our legal system. The rules of professional conduct when properly applied serve to define that relationship. We have, we have been applying these rules for, for many, many years. It's why I have a job. And I think that further speaks to the point uh, to the argument for exempting attorneys. Last, I know you have to run, but I, I love your discussion about coming up with just basic principles. And in a way, that's what I've done. You know, Terry mentioned that how long the rules are, they're over almost 200 pages. They're, they're almost impossible for practicing lawyers to remember in the moment. And to Pat McDonald's point, they're almost impossible for a non-lawyer to read and figure out what should I expect from my attorney. So what I've done, my job includes helping lawyers not to violate the rules. So I do a lot of seminars. I've asked lawyers to distill the rules, the 200 pages, down to five concepts. We're going to be competent. We're going to communicate with our clients. We're going to maintain our client confidences. We're going to avoid conflicts. And we're going to be candid. Five, five one word, five single words that each begin with the letter C. Now to make it more catchy, I added two more so that I now have the seven C's of legal ethics. And I talk about sailing the seven C's of ethics. And those are commingling because we are entrusted with other people's money. We shouldn't commingle it with ours and civility, which I think is uh, sometimes lost. And we need to remember that advocating for our clients doesn't mean we get to be uncivil. But I think that that I raised this because it's doable to come up with these basic tenets because we've done it within the legal profession here. So thank you. Thank you. I'm going to suggest that we need to jump now, but I'm putting this on the agenda for next month, next Tuesday. And what I'm going to do is because I, I have really strong, you probably haven't guessed this, but I have really strong feelings about this and you very a lot of concerns. I'm going to have Anthony run the meeting. Is that okay, Anthony? Sure. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. And perhaps if we could um, everybody reread the, the last um, everything we've gotten so far. And um, I don't know if we got from TJ and um, the judiciary, if we got, if we got the language or if you have the language, but whatever we have and figure out and then read the draft that we have before us and figure out where and how we would have to put in exemptions. And then Anthony will run the meeting. Yes, Senator Clarkson, you're muted. I'm trying so hard. TJ, you said you were going to send us something from NCSL, or maybe you did, and Gail just hasn't posted it. Although there is something from NCSL posted called Privilege and Immunity Protecting the Legislative Process. I don't think that's what you were talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking about. That's oh, okay. what the NCSL uses to train legislators. Okay. Okay, great. So this is, so okay. we, I, I would encourage us to look at this too, because I- Yes, I have read that. Yeah, I thought that was good. Me too. Okay, I'm going to have us, um, do we need to take a, just a five minute break? That that would be great. That'll the put us only- really, I apologize, the sun is so lovely, uh, uh, but I have to close my eyes sometimes because it is- It's bright. just- Fine. You're going to not take a walk. We're going to have a five minute break and you can take a walk afterwards. Okay.